That's the sound of a cooper's hawk giving a warning call before it decides to take further measures to protect its young that sit high up in a nest in a tree at a park in northeast Albuquerque. Like most wildlife biologists, Kristen Madden with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, along with Brian Millsap from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, are up before sunrise setting up a mist net to capture swooping cooper's hawks during their nesting season, which runs from May to July. The department and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are teaming up to learn more about this once woodland raptor turned urban dweller. We're looking at cooper's hawks throughout the city, um, trying to understand their population biology, survival rates, patterns of movements, nesting success, those kinds of things. Um, you know, we're interested in cooper's hawks not only because they're cooper's hawks, but because they can tell us a lot of things about biology of other raptors that are harder to study. Like, uh, we're very interested in golden eagles and we're doing lots of work on golden eagles, but because eagles are so widespread and they're so long-lived, a lot of these questions are harder to answer with eagles than they are with, with, with something like a cooper's hawk that's much more abundant and, e and easy to get to. Uh, they started out as woodland raptors. They've become our most common urban raptor now in cities really across the country. We've got, um, we've got them pretty much every 300 meters in Albuquerque. They're about a crow-sized hawk. Uh, generally about 80% of their diet in the city is uh, pigeons and doves. Females are usually about a third larger than males. They show some of the greatest sexual dimorphism, which just means that females are bigger than males, um, in any of the raptors. In order to successfully capture the Cooper's hawks, a rehabilitated great horned owl named Eve is put to work. Uh, this is really her only job. Um, she, my collaborator with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Brian Millsap, she lives with him. She's permitted specifically to act as a lure bird for this. Uh, she works maybe maybe a couple of months a year, and that's it. And the rest of the time, she lives up in the in the East Mountains and has a fantastic flight cage. Um, and she, you know, it's surprising how well they shake it off. We'll put her back in the in the truck after each event. She'll fluff up her feathers and you know look for some water, and and she does just fine with it. After data is gathered on the hawks, including eye color, weight, and wingspan, the hawks are then banded and released. Around 60 nesting pairs of Cooper's hawks have been found in just northeast Albuquerque, and there are many more around the city. Each year, there are around 20 calls in the city about aggressive hawks, and those calls are almost all about yeah. Cooper's and hawks. We've been doing a three-year study on aggression, nest site aggression towards humans in Cooper's hawks. It starts right when the chicks hatch. Really, the incidence of actual physical strike is very, very low. They'll make the sound that you can hear behind me to try to keep people away, but it's, it's really only as long as they have the chicks. It starts after hatch, may spike a little bit more when the chicks are starting to fledge, and then it pretty much dissipates immediately after that. Most of the time, the, the coexistence is, you know, there's no, no effort required. The birds do their thing, we do our thing, and we're in perfect harmony. Where the birds become aggressive, you know, the, a couple things that you can do. One is you'll realize that there's certain things that you might be doing that, that cause them to be aggressive. Walking under the nest tree, um, you know, particular, you know, lawn care, uh, watering over here and not over there. You know, if you can find something that's easy to avoid, like walking right into the nest, walk around it, that's a, that's a good step to take. If the birds are really aggressive, most of the time, even when they are dive bombing you, they will not hit you, but occasionally they will. A way to deal with that is to carry an umbrella, um, wear a hat, something to kind of cover your head. Uh, an umbrella works great. They can't get to you under an umbrella. And so if you're really truly afraid of a bird hitting you, just wear an umbrella and walk. Do your best to avoid the area where the birds are defending. And if that's possible, you know, these bouts of aggression only last a few weeks. When the young are, are first coming out of the nest, um, that's when the adults are really aggressive. And as soon as the young are mobile and able to hop around and fly through the trees, the adults kind of back off. So if you can tolerate it for a week to 10 days, then all will be good. <laughs> Once the chicks, also known as fledglings, are ready to fly around July, the second part of the study begins to gather similar data on the adolescent hawks. Brian and Kristen spot three siblings who are out looking for breakfast together. Using live sparrows and starlings that are protected within a wire cage, the biologists play on the young hawks' curiosity and are able to capture them. Hey, 
The transmitters are just fitting beautifully. I mean, I've looked at every one of the birds and you cannot see them. I mean, they just... After data is gathered, the fledglings are equipped with tiny transmitter backpacks. The tracking device has Teflon straps that fit under the bird's feathers with a tiny transmitter. So, uh, so we'll be able to track this bird for about two and a half years. Fascinatingly, Albuquerque's Cooper's hawks seem to like it here and don't usually migrate, but stay here all year round. I mean, we are in the early years of the study. This is really year two. So we've, we now have birds that we tagged last year that were able to recite at nests. And so we're getting information on survival rates. The survival rate actually has been very high. I, I haven't calculated it, but we're finding most of the pairs back where we banded them, which is a good thing. Um, we're seeing, um, you know, the, it's interesting from year to year, you see differences in when they are nesting and how successful the nests are. So we're beginning to get a feeling about those things. I think one of the things that's a little surprising is we're seeing um, uh, there's a, a, a gland on the birds called the uropygial gland. It's a, a gland that produces oil. The birds collect that oil and then print it over their feathers. It's what keeps their feathers waterproof. We're catching a handful of birds that have a, a, an infection of that gland. Um, we don't know what that means. We don't know how serious it is, and we're looking into that right now. Um, but it's something that's not very common. So there's something going on. I mean, it may just be the equivalent of a, a flu strain going through the population. We'll see, but that's a bit surprising to us. Uh, you know, we, I think the, the overall things that are surprising are just the high density of hawks in, this, in, in Albuquerque. Uh, again, we're seeing on average a distance between nests of, you know, no more than a quarter to a half a mile. And that's a very densely packed population of hawks.